Yes, I'm using Vista. You can all make fun of me later. I have to support it, so I have to learn it. And it had to move every little freaking control panel in different locations for no apparent reason. You all just let me know whenever you're ready for me to do my thing. I'm going I'm to unpack some stuff. By the way, anybody wants to play with any of these key loggers, after my presentation, I'm going to be going upstairs for like the next hour or two. And uh, I'm going to have this and then some keyboards and an extra computer. And uh, people can screw around with these and uh, play with them and see what they do. Will you be logging in? Hell no. <laughs> in theory, I cleaned my passwords off of every one of these ones I've tested. But do me a favor and please don't look at the Slack space because I didn't actually do a forensic swipe. <laughs> Uh, and if you have any questions about... Right uh, yeah, I figured you would, Scott. Scott Milton's speak, uh, talk is coming up later on, so you want to catch that one as well, because there's going to be some things I'm going to vaguely mention in mine that I don't know the answer to, but I'm sure Scott does, so ask him. <laughs> has to do with desoldering NAND chips and actually being able to pull data off of them. You ready? All right. Today's presentation for me is on hardware keyloggers use, detection, and mitigation. My name is Adrian Crenshaw, and I go by Iron Geek online. I'm going to uh, pull a page from Johnny Long's handbook and uh, tell a little bit about myself. I go by Iron Geek online. I run irongeek.com. I do a lot of uh, video tutorials and some articles. I hope some of you visited my site before. I have an interest in InfoSec education. Uh, at this point, InfoSec is more of a hobby than anything, a lot than anything. But I read a lot, I play with a lot of stuff, a lot of Soho equipment, and generally have a good time. I don't, and this is one of the things I'm gonna pull from Bruce Potter. I don't know everything. I can be wrong. I'm just a geek with a lot of extra spare time in my hands. If I'm wrong, come up and tell me. I'd be glad to hear it. Point me in the right direction. I don't know everything about everything, and there's gonna be some things that. This Talk. I'm sure I'll get wrong, but I'm interested in hearing what the actual way things work are if you happen to know it. And another thing is my level of professionalism varies depending on where I'm presenting. Um, some days I'm like this. Uh, thanks for Ben for taking this photo for me. And other days I'm a little bit more like this. <laughs> Considering I'm presenting at Freaknik, I think it's going to be more like the latter. Okay, this is how all this research started. I realized I started getting a fair amount of traffic on my website. And I hear about people talking about getting free demo units from vendors so they can review and put them on their website. And, you know, I'm a cheap individual, okay? I'll make a penny scream. So I basically asked for a bunch of free stuff from people. And web traffic equals toys. Now, this works out in my advantage because I get new tech stuff to play with that I wouldn't be able to normally afford. And the people who send me the stuff, get, they'll get the product reviewed on a high-traffic website. And assuming I like it, it's very good advertisement for them for very little investment. So hopefully I can get a few more uh, review units in. I currently only have six keyloggers with me. Hopefully I'll be able to get more at future cons, and I'll just happen to carry them with me. Okay. First question would probably be, what is a hardware keylogger? The name is fairly self-explanatory. And I'm assuming my audio is picking up okay? All right. Uh, the name is fairly self-explanatory. You can see this um, nest of wires and other crud behind my computer and the dust lupuses and so forth. That's a hardware keylogger plugged in line with my keyboard. Essentially, the ones I'm going to be covering, there's different types. The main ones I'm going to be covering, however, are inline hardware keyloggers, mostly of the USB variety. And uh, they work pretty simply. This isn't a hardware keylogger, this is just a PS2 to USB converter that happens to work with the Model M keyboard. God's keyboard. Yes, yeah. Woo! But essentially, they just plug in in line, then plug in to the computer. Now, there's other types of hardware keyloggers. Uh, 
There's a picture of me with a hardware keylogger installed. Wish I had a laser pointer that was better. That one kind of stuck, so what I have. There's a PS2 hardware keyboard that's inline. There's another one that's a USB. They also make internal hardware key loggers. I have yet to get a chance to play with one of these. I do want to get a chance. Like this one is a PCI. There's a PCI Express. And, oh, thank you very much, Scott. There's a, a PCI Express. And this is a little internal unit. You can either build your own hardware key logger, or you can actually, if you're good at crimping and soldering, go into your keyboard and put it in yourself. Uh, I believe this unit is from Keylog, K-E-E -E Log. Uh, these two as well. That one might be a Key Llama. More details on that later. I think this one's from uh, Key Carbon. But I'm basically going to be covering the inline hardware key loggers, like this one and this one, because that's what I currently have. All right. There are several advertised uses on why people would want to buy one of these hardware key loggers. The first one I usually present is writers. Users can install in their own system as a backup for the work they've typed in. I have no idea about how you all write stuff, but when I write articles, I, my mind does not work in coherent, literal, literal, blah, 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 literal, thanks again for giving this to me, uh, in uh, linear ways. So I'll be typing up here on something, I'll be typing up here, I'll be presenting ideas here, and I'll change my mind about where I want to move stuff. I'm copying and pasting left and right, I'm typing at the top of the document, I'm typing at the bottom of the document. If I was to try to use this to recover what I typed in, it would be more work than just typing the freaking thing from the beginning. So, not to mention, hard drive space is cheap. Some of the cheaper of these hardware key loggers are at least 50 bucks. I get for like, you know, and the more expensive ones are like 300 bucks. For that price, I can buy a huge ass hard drive and back up everything several times over. Or back up, or you can buy small PCs and just have, you know, a backup box someplace. So, the thing for writers, eh, I don't think that's legitimate. That's why I have the half frowny, half smiley face beside it, which doesn't exactly work well as an emoticon. All right, another reason that the uh, vendors say that people might want to buy one of these is if you're a business and you want to track what your users are doing. However, my personal feeling on this, if you're worried about employee misconduct and you're a corporation, you probably have better ways to roll this out. I work in a mostly Windows shop in the past. Um, we'd probably roll out something via GPO if we really wanted to know. And, of course, there's network sniffers to find out what people are doing. Just, if you're a business, there's a lot better ways you can track what users are doing for misconduct than this. Yes? Can any of the PCI key loggers just uh, reverse that capture from the clipboard type of thing? Unfortunately, I've not actually messed with any of the PCI key loggers. But any of them you've seen claim to be able to do it? I haven't seen anyone claim to do it, no. To my knowledge, they wouldn't be able to. Businesses could either roll their own software, roll it out via GPO, uh, get software key loggers that can automatically report back information uh, because they, they control what AV they run, antiviruses, um, so they can find one that doesn't set off the AV system. So I really don't see businesses using these hardware key loggers. Uh, some people say parents might use one. And maybe they would, depending on how you know, tech literate they are. But quite frankly, if your kid is uh, smart enough to be getting around the internet and doing things you don't like, he's going to be smart enough to look at the back of his machine and see this if he knows it's there. If you're a parent, you'd just be so much better off finding some net nanny software, installing that, making sure your kid's not an admin, or just talking to your kid. Thank you. So many people go into this whole, you know, worried about what the kid sees. How about this? Pay attention to what your child's doing online. And don't worry about it. Like, sit down with him, explain why you don't want to look at certain things, why you don't want to do certain things. Definitely don't set him up with an admin account so he goes to MySpace and installs a bunch of crap, and then you have to remove spyware left and right. <laughs> and the final reason that sometimes advertised, this is the one I think is legitimate, is for pen testers, crackers, spies, and jealous significant others. I get a fair number of emails on my website from people like, I think my boyfriend or girlfriend's cheating on me. How do I tell whether or not they're cheating on me? The truth be told, I imagine the number one reason they sell any of these things is probably for that last reason. However, I do think these things have um, benefit for tiger teams and you know individual uh, corporate spies. But if you're a tiger team and you have a legitimate reason to pin test the boxes, I can see these coming in of you know great use. So this is a, number four I actually see as a legitimate reason why someone wouldn't like them. Now comes the legal question. I am not a lawyer. I ain't all. Um, 
the legality of it is a little bit confusing. If you own the box, my understanding is it's basically legal. But if you share the box with someone else and they don't know it is, the wiretapping laws apply to a lot more than just telephone wiretapping. And um, I think it's the guy, remember by name, Trip? Was that his last name yesterday? Yeah, he uh, was given a good, great presentation. I hope to be able to link to it on my website on the legalities of war driving. And some of the stuff he covered also bears this in mind. So whether or not it's legal is of question. Definitely, I'd say going into someone else's house and installing one of these is illegal. Someone installing it on their own machine to, to track the significant other, eh, it's a little more questionable. Yes, sir. Yeah, I heard of some judgment. There was a judge someplace that basically said that this was not wiretapping. However, to say it's not wiretapping for the FBI is not to say it's not wiretapping. I have to imagine those laws would be applied differently depending on who's doing it. And I'm not going out encouraging people to spy on the significant others and all that. Just pointing out that the use of these things is probably is a legal gray area depending on where and when and how you use them. Swift, Aiden. All right. I'm a negative kind of person, prone to think about the worst case scenario. So I'm going to go over the cons of hardware keyloggers versus software keyloggers. I'm assuming most of you know what a software keylogger is. It's basically an application you can install on your machine. It logs to a text file or some hidden spot on your hard drive. And people, it logs everything via software as opposed to being a physical hardware device. The cons of the hardware keyloggers is it's a little harder to recover keystrokes remotely. You pretty much have to install it physically, have physical access to the box, then when you want to get the logs back, you have to go back in and recover the device. Hard, software key loggers, generally you have a bunch of ones that email people or you can get it over the network. You can sometimes install them over the network of those vulnerabilities on the box. So from that standpoint, these are a little hard to use. Yes, I know there are exceptions. Everybody and their brother <laughs> um, emailed me about uh, some students' work over in uh, Switzerland on um, doing what's essentially Vanek freaking. Or Tempest. Everybody ever heard of uh, Vanek freaking or Tempest? For those who don't, essentially, every time you have a current go change state, you have electromagnetic waves put out. If you get an antenna and a little amplifier and you look at it the right way, you can catch those signals and figure out what someone's doing. I think the original things they used this for was like looking at CRT monitors and seeing what was showing up on the screen. But uh, there were some Swiss students who figured out how to do it with keyboards. However, the demos I was sent. It looked like it was a great theoretical attack, but they had to unhook power supplies and I think maybe turn off fans to make it work so it would be a very EM quiet room. So how practical that attack is, I'm not sure. Also, there are people now making hardware key loggers that have a Bluetooth component. So essentially, you have to install it the initial time, but from thereafter, you just have to go nearby the offices with your phone, and I believe it's via like Obex Perch or something, and you can basically grab the key log off using your phone or laptop, which is awfully nifty. I'm trying to get one of those units in for review. I've heard, I have contacts at Key Llama and Key Log, and they've both told me that it's, the, the effective range is not that good on those. The people at Key Log told me they're trying to develop their own that's not Bluetooth based. How exactly they're going to do that, I don't know. And, uh, uh, Ziploc's uh, colleague, Max Mosier, and uh, another friend of his whose name escapes me at the moment, but you know, I do want to give the person proper credit for the research. They've been doing some work on uh, intercepting uh, the keyboards that use the 20 me 27 megahertz uh, space uh, and being able to get that. Max Mosier and uh, Philip Schrodel. But they've been doing some work on that. I'm not going to be covering any of that in this particular talk, however. Also, there are all Bluetooth uh, keyboards, but there is a key exchange there. I haven't really looked into how easy it would be to sniff that particular communication, but if anybody knows, come up to me at the con and let me know what you know about that particular issue. Another con with hardware key loggers is you get less information. A software key logger can tell you easily what time of day it is, so can some hardware key loggers, what application the people are in, uh, other things they were doing at the time, possibly grab stuff out of the clipboard, 
uh, maybe make screenshots. There's also some extra stuff you can do with software monitoring that you can't with these hardware key loggers. Also, money. Uh, the cheapest one I have up here, I think it's about 88 bucks. You can get a really low memory uh, PS2 one for like 33 at the cheapest, I think. Um, you can fi find free uh, software key loggers online. And finally, these things are incredibly easy to remove if found. So if you have like a kid you're monitoring, it seems you, you're the parent who wanted to monitor what the kid's doing using a hardware key logger, your kid can easily find this and pull it out. However, if you don't install him as, set him up as an admin and you install a software key logger, that's going to be harder for him to remove than one of these. Now the uh, PCI ones I talked about earlier, that's a little bit different issue because they'd have to know it's there. But I'm pretty sure those ones would have to show up in the device manager someplace. Now for the pros of hardware key loggers. And there are several of them. The number one is stealth. Um, remember when I was looking around for different software key loggers, and most of them, most ones, unless they're like professionally made and sold as monitoring utilities and they cost money, most of them were detected by antivirus as malware. And assume you don't want them on the system. So if the person has any kind of antivirus package on their box, more than likely, those key loggers will not work. However, these ones are fairly silent. They say nowhere, no way to detect them in software. I'm going to show a little bit later. That's not 100% true. But in general, these ones are much more stealthy and aren't to be picked up by an antivirus package. However, most software key loggers will be. If you want a software key logger that won't be picked up and it's free, um, White Scorpion did some work on a uh, software key logger. I have it posted on my website. He did most of the hard work on it. I just added a little functionality to make it email you. But essentially what you do with it is you compile it yourself, you change a few key strings, and hopefully it doesn't get picked up by um, uh, signatures or heuristics. Heuristics it might get picked up by. Another awesome pro of hardware key loggers is they log independent of boot state. Uh, for instance, in um, Windows NT-based systems, there are certain processes that cannot be spied on by other processes. And for instance, uh, GINA with initial login. Depending on how the key log is installed, it may not be able to see the initial login. Since this is physically connected between the keyboard and the computer itself, it can grab that. Also, BIOS passwords. Machines aren't even completely booted yet. You're not going to be able to get that password with a software key logger necessarily, but you can get it with one of these. And OS independent. You can install one of these. Well, this is, there's some exceptions to this, but it, as long as it uh, complies to the normal specifications of like USB HID, uh, it should work fine in Linux, Windows, OS X. I believe all these key loggers I've tested in uh, Linux and Windows, I don't have an OS X box to test with. But I'm sure someone here does. If you want to play with it on your machine, I'll be upstairs after this talk. Okay, now for a little demo of how these recovery uh, schemes work. Here's the six different hardware key loggers I have with me right now. There's essentially three ways, and sometimes they have more than one option with individual loggers, that you can recover logs off of a key logger. Either you hit a key sequence and it turns it into a thumb drive that you can copy a text log off of, or you hit a key sequence and um, it essentially creates a virtual keyboard and starts typing into a text editor the menu system and recover the log. And finally, some have uh, quick downloaders, basically software that you have to install on your machine to uh, grab the logs off, and it does it quicker than just having it type it out in the notepad. But at this point, I am going to uh, tab out of this and see if I can actually illustrate some of those. Now, this is a part I haven't tested so well. So let's see if this totally screws up or not. Once again... Pull up my model in Keyboard of the Gods. And I'm going to, uh, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show a PS2 hardware key logger that I happen to have with me. Doesn't take up much space, and that's probably going to not be seen by most people in the back of the machine. At least not the rat nest that I have in the back of my machine. I'm going to plug that in line. And this is only here to convert 
PS2 to USB because I don't have any PS2 ports in this laptop. Okay, doing the initial power up, and I'm going to cover stealth on this in a little bit, but the basic way this works is each one of these uh, different key loggers has a different key sequence to make it go into recovery mode. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to type some stuff so we have something in the log because assuming I did this correctly, I cleared out the log before I brought these up here. So please don't pwn me if I happen to have one of my passwords in here. Okay, I'm going to type in some text. I like the word monkey, so I'll type the word monkey. Um, this is going to cover something I'm going to talk about a little bit later in the presentation, but there are certain key loggers that have problems logging odd keystrokes. Who here knows about uh, using Alt Numpad to type in odd ASCII characters? I have an article on my website, The Alpha and Omega of Obscure Passwords. Essentially, um, yes. Essentially, you can um, hold down the Alt key and type on the numpad the ASCII equivalent, the ASCII character code for a certain character, and it will put it out the keyboard. In that case, I did Alt-234, which is the Omega symbol. Uh, I could do Alt-1, Alt-2, Alt-3, Alt-4. You get the idea. It's essentially, but it's not really winging, so it's, pulling it, it's uh, basically just pulling out characters from the ASCII characters chart. And it's also a way of pulling ANSI. I have it all in that article I have on my website. I think I linked to it at some point in time in my presentation. All right, I'm going to type in test end so that we have we know where it ends. Um, now I'm going to put it in recovery mode. And since my memory is not that good, it's either KBD, <sighs> KBS or KBD. I don't remember which one it is on this particular logger. I can't, apparently it's KBD. Now this one uses the virtual keyboard scheme where essentially... It, uh, when you hit the right key sequence, it starts typing everything out for you, and you get a menu system that you can use to do work with. I screwed that up because I switched uh, to a different. I switched to a different application while I was playing with it, so I kind of screwed that up. This works whatever uh, text editor you want. You can use VI; doesn't matter. You can use Notepad plus uh, plus K editor. It just really doesn't matter. I don't have the full menu there. Uh, because I screwed up and started moving the window before he was finished typing. I'm going to hit 1, and it's going to let me view memory. I'm going to view from the first page. Some of these ones that use a virtual keyboard will also let you um, filter out by certain strings, like show me only URLs that were typed in, or show me stuff that might be a password. And there's also uh, log parsers that do that. But you can see here, I held down the Alt key a whole lot. And looking at it, it's, you don't see I typed an Omega symbol. But you do see I held down Alt, and I hit 2, 3, and if I look through there long enough, I should see a 2, 3, 4 in there someplace. It would be hard to decipher, but it is in there. And, of course, you see where I typed Shift Monkey to put the capital in there. And you also see uh, where I typed Freak Nick. And I have excessive logging turned on in this one. You have options on a lot of these on how much you want to log. Uh, I usually set it all the way up, so I get a lot of characters that make it harder to decipher, but I get stuff like that alt numpad. The reason I mentioned the whole alt numpad technique is the key carbon, which is a lot more expensive, doesn't log those. At least not in the firmware I tested. I tried to update the firmware before I came to the convention, and I think I bricked it. We'll find out when we go upstairs later on. Now, a lot of times you can uh, configure these via the menu, change things about like what they log, uh, how fast they type out. I'm going to go back to the main menu by hitting 4. And of course, I have to hit 4 on this keyboard. And in hindsight, I should have moved that to the end of the page. <laughs> I can do a string search. I can disable logging. A net detective, which should show me, I believe, on this particular model, uh, what URLs people have typed in. You get the general idea. I can also erase the memory by hitting 2 and uh, proceed, which is obviously something you want to do before you sell the keylogger to someone else. But uh, this one, I, I still have all these set to the default passwords. You can change all these passwords to something else. I just kept them to the default so I easily wouldn't have to remember them. Uh, when you're playing with them upstairs, please don't change the passwords because I have no way of recovering those. 
Uh, but feel free to pl play with them doing pretty much anything but change the password. Um, proceed, all will be lost. Ah, wrong keyboard. And that memory is trashed, in theory. And I can either key press and put it back into log mode. Uh, that's one way. Now, this particular one is the PS2 uh, uh, Key Llama. Key Llama essentially uh, sells a bunch of other people's key loggers, and they also import from Key Log and rebrand them. Um, these ones aren't firmware upgradable. The Key Carbon is, but like I said, I have other problems with the Key Carbon. Uh, these ones aren't firmware upgradable directly by the user, but my understanding is you can send them back to the factory in Poland and get them uh, updated. I've showed this one, and this one, by the way, also has a fast downloader feature. I can plug it into this. It becomes a thumb drive, and I can just copy off a text log. Now let me show you a different kind of key logger. This one is, uh, this is the key log, not the key llama. Like I said, it's essentially the same thing, different branding. Um, and I'm sure uh, Doug from <laughs> Key Llama will email me later on and tell me that's not quite correct. Uh, they're actually going to be making some of their own as well. They're going to be making a U.S. variety that has supports encryption. I'm not sure how soon that's going to come out, but hopefully I can get one of those for review. But just plugging that one in line. And I'm going to show how it works. Okay. Pick my keyboards back up. And I'm going to type in some more funky characters. And, uh, And we're going to put this one into recovery mode. <coughs> and I believe it's KBS all at the same time on this particular model. What that did is this keyboard does now stop functioning. You see it's installing a device. By the way, for reasons I'll cover later on in the presentation, if someone was actually doing a pen test and they didn't want to be known, they'd really want to take this logger home with them to recover the logs and not do it on the machine that they're logging from. And I'll explain why here in a bit. Devices are ready to use. All right. Not incredibly long. I'm not real sure. I haven't actually timed it, but not incredibly long. <coughs> Let's see if I have anything embarrassing out here. All right. Remove drive F. You'll see two files in here. Uh, one is log.txt. One is config.txt. I'm going to open up config.txt. Here I can set things like what password it's using. Other ones you have to set the password via the menu. I had can set what all logs. I told it log everything. Granted, it's going to be bigger logs, make it more confusing, but I want to get everything. And disable logging? Hell no. We have that enabled. Okay. And here's the log. A simple little text file with the stuff I typed. And you see I, Alt, free on the number pad, Freaknik. I love Freaknik. And that's basically how most of these key logs work. I'm not going to show the uh, fast downloader function. Some of them, like I believe the Key Ghost, has a piece of downloading software that so you don't have to type it all out into a menu system. It doesn't act like a thumb drive ever, to my knowledge. But so you don't have to type everything out into a menu system. You can use this fast downloader. It puts it in recovery mode and grabs the log off a lot faster than having it type. Um, okay, back to the presentation then. That's the basics of how they work, and everybody can get a chance to play with them after this presentation's over with. Do you have any to support a timestamp? Yes, sir. Uh, <coughs> this particular Key Ghost one that's really huge and obvious <laughs> does support timestamping. This one's like, I want to say in the $300 range, unfortunately. These ones are more like 88 bucks. I'm going to cover a little bit of that, but yeah, these ones do support timestamping. If you're, all support, uh, if you're all doing a forensic analysis for, like, employee misconduct, you're going to want the damn time stamping. Because otherwise, it's really easy to say someone else is there on the, at the time that machine was uh, being used. A lot of these don't time stamp. This one does. Like I said, once again, if you're a company doing this kind of investigation, and you'd have a better idea about this than I would, because I don't do this kind of thing professionally, my thought process on it is that uh, you'd want to use a piece of software for doing that kind of tracking instead. But if you had to use a key logger, you'd want to have a good timestamp to know whether or not the person was there. And even that might be questioned, depending. All right, what features matter? 
All these key loggers advertise different features, and some may matter to you and some may not. All right, does size matter? How long does it take to, you to type a 2 meg uh, text file? Now, a lot of people uh, get a little weirded out by the fact, wait, this thing only has, a, only has 2 megs of space on it. I mean, that's infinitesimally small. My, my thumb drive has like 32 gigs on it. Come on. Well, think about how long it takes you to actually type 2 megs of text. That's a lot of key presses. Uh, and if you're really that worried about it, not much more anymore, you can get like a 2 gig one. That's probably more typing than I've done on any single computer I've ever had in my life. But yeah, try to type the, uh, out uh, 2 megs of text sometime, and you'll see that 2 megs is nothing to really be complained about. So I'm not sure how much size matters, but if it's only a few bucks to get a few gigs, I'd go with that. Log parsers. Different one of these can uh, systems, different ones of these key loggers come with their own log parsers. Like the key ghost ones I have, which is this one and this one. They have log parsers where you can quickly pull out email addresses that are found, init URLs, logins, and so forth. And that helps the analysis a lot, speeds it up. The one on the uh, right-hand side is, uh, comes with the key llamas, and it's another log parser, and it has options for searching for strings and uh, for certain pertinent data that you might want to find. However, you could also just write your own. I mean, Perl's great for handling strings. I'm lame, so I use Autoit for a lot of stuff. If you're a Python hacker, use Python. I'm pretty sure most of us have done some kind of text handling in the past. All it is is a plain text file at that point. So, you know, go to town and pass out what you want. Though ultimately, sometimes, for unhandled exceptions, you probably want to look at the log yourself. All right, next comes up the question of whether or not the encryption feature is worthwhile. Some of my key loggers here, the more expensive ones, apparently encrypt the data as it stores the flash. Others don't. And this is a topic I really want to discuss more with Scott sometime because I'm confused about when you can and when you can't recover this stuff. All right. I can see a need for uh, the data to be encrypted if you're a pen tester. And let's say you're a pen tester that's doing uh, an analysis of a company that has a lot of HIPAA data or uh, possibly PCI stuff. Um, you really don't want someone else stealing the key logger, taking it home, and grabbing all that data. I'm pretty damn sure you'd be held liable, and that'd be a bad scene. So for that case, I would really think it is worthwhile to get encryption so that someone doesn't do that. On the other hand, if you've changed the password away from the default, I'm not sure how easy it is for them to crack it. I mean, they're not going to easily be able to brute force the password, considering how slow it's going to be to uh, use this particular interface. And other than that, even the um, the data is stored on here, it doesn't act like a thumb drive well, except for this PS2 one, which I might talk about later upstairs. Uh, it doesn't act like a thumb drive until you enter that certain key sequence. If you don't know that key sequence, that pretty much limits you to, uh, unless the uh, manufacturer has a back door on them, it pretty much limits you to desoldering the surface mount NAND chips, uh, mounting them someplace else, trying to figure out the proprietary format that they store the data in, and pulling it off, which I'm not sure how practical that attack is. Uh, let's put it this way. I wouldn't want to put myself liable for you know, a major lawsuit by not having the encryption feature, but at the same time, I'm not sure how likely it is, unless the person's really well motivated and really well financed, that they're going to be able to steal the hardware keylogger and get your data off of it. Yes, after a fashion. And I'm going to cover a little bit of that later on. The first thing I would do is if I found one and I was thinking I was going to be able to do anything legal about it, I'd have a cop come by to actually remove it and be able to check it for fingerprints. And some of these do have serial numbers on it. The companies I've seen reports on from say they would not report uh, who bought what, but, uh, and I'll show you this in a slide a little bit later, they do have serial numbers on them. Well, some of them do. All right, timestamps. Like I said before, and I kind of covered this earlier, if you're doing a forensics analysis, you really do want the timestamp function, and you were asking about this and the key ghost does, or at least some of the key ghost ones do do timestamps, and it essentially looks like this. You see in the log where it says it was powered on, uh, starting the session, what time it was done, I, that was the time of day. And by the way, it does keep the time separate from the computer. So even if I unplug this, it's still somehow keeping time. I'm not sure exactly how it does it. I don't know if it's got a few batteries in there, or actually, I can pretty much tell you it doesn't have batteries because, yeah, it does, right there. More on this later, but one of them, it, it looks like a little bitty watch battery. 
more on this in a bit because I broke one of them when they sent it to me, and I took it apart. As every good hacker should do with everything that breaks. All right. Also, another feature you might be interested in is there seems to be some problematic keyboard combinations. For instance, I had a, a Dell GX260 and a GX, Dell GX280, and whenever I used the uh, key log or key llama key loggers, that's a lot of keys, uh, with the, uh, these particular model of Dell keyboards, it would always screw up on me. I would type in something like this, and I'd get out these particular results. However, if I used a different keyboard on that same computer, no problem. Same keyboard, different computer, no problem. It was only that combination. Um, Doug Kerford, I believe his name is, at Keylam, was actually kind enough to try to test this out for me. He had bought the exact same hardware I had. He couldn't replicate it. I haven't heard of other people replicating it, but I had this problem with some of them, so you might want to be aware of this. I believe I talked to them, and if you had this particular problem, they'd be willing to accept the, the product back because you can't use it. But... Keep in mind that some seem more compatible than others, depending on what you have. That's one of the reasons I want someone to come upstairs and test these out with a Macintosh, because while I say that it's OS independent, I could be slightly incorrect. I have mostly, all these are USB except for one PS2 one. Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, if I ever do a flyby on any information you want to know, just, you know, raise your hand, give me a yell. Yes, Darren. Um, honestly, you know, that's a lovely question, and I got a keyboard over here, I think, with some extra f function key. R let's test that. That's a lovely question I hadn't thought about, but, yeah, Darren from Hack5, thank you very much for that idea. We'll, we'll test it upstairs here in a bit, because I honestly do not know. Uh, my understanding, I, I think it does an overwrite, but we're talking about typing in two megs of data. I haven't done it. I suppose I need to test it, but, you know, I'd actually, you know, I couldn't just copy and paste to replicate. I'd actually have to start typing it in, and I haven't done it. So, yeah, hold down the key. This is a Model M keyboard. This one would be just fine. But if anybody happens to be near a door and bring me a nap, a towel or something, I'd appreciate it. Um, I have yet to fill one up. That's something else I would need to test. It's a good question, but I honestly don't know the answer. But we're talking about two megs of data or more. It's going to take you a while to fill that up. Yes. I have yet to use one for KVM. I'd imagine it would work. Other than it might slow down the whole um, auditing of what stuff's out on the USB bus in the case of a USB one. The PS2, I'm pretty sure it would just plain work. I'm going to unplug this before I start stroking the keys. Thank you very much. We do have the occasional calamity here at Freaknik. Luckily, this is a Model M keyboard. It'll dry out. It'll be just fine. All right. Going back to the uh, mitigation, what can we do? First of all, physical inspection. And unfortunately, this is the best way I've found to find key loggers and avoid them. Using the alt numpad approach, which I mentioned before. And by the way, this alt numpad thing, I mean, the uh, key carbon totally screws up if you're using, if you're using uh, the alt numpad approach. And you don't have to just type in weird characters. It has a problem with alt numpad, period. For instance, you might see this particular uh, sequence right here. And, Scott, I didn't destroy this, so it's okay. <laughs> Thank you for loaning this to me. Uh, you Notice I used this key sequence. This is essentially using all the ASCII equivalents to type in the word password. As you can see, the key carbon totally failed at actually logging that. Somehow or another, I just got all A's out. Oh, is that that one? Yeah, I believe so. So you can type in an actual normal password. Then again, if you know that a, uh, uh, the only amount of time you might do it that way is if you know a keylog is on that machine. If you know a keylog is on that machine, I'm not sure you'd want to use that machine, period. Okay, the on-screen keyboard. Depending on how the uh, software keylogger is designed, it would catch this. However, the uh, hardware keylogger will not. Now we'll go on to detection. And this is a field I have an interest in. And unfortunately, for most of these, I haven't found a good way. But there's some ways you can kind of sort of detect what's going on with the USB hardware key loggers. First of all, physical inspection is still the best. However, what we want to do is find a better way in software, some kind of heuristics approach. Uh, 
to find these hardware key loggers. It has to be done in software, must be automated, must be reliable to where it finds most of them, and few false positives. If people are constantly getting warnings that something's changed in your USB, but you may want to worry about hardware key loggers. If they're constantly getting this, U- this message like you, what UAC and Vista does, they're going to start ignoring it. It's no good. It has to be rare enough occasion where people will pay attention to it. So there's a few ways you can uh, detect some hardware key loggers. For instance, the key carbon, whenever it's plugged in, it shows up as a USB hub device. The key log, however, is completely passive. So based on this hub device showing up, you can go, huh, that's a hub device that wasn't there before. Maybe someone's installed something in my system. I was hoping for a unique vendor ID. However, it doesn't have a unique vendor ID. I looked up this one. This vendor ID belongs to Texas Instruments, and the product ID just says generic, like Texas Instruments Hub. All right, a little refresher on uh, how um, some stuff in USB works. Uh, the, U- the USB IF basically uh, gives certain numbers to different companies. You know how like the first few bytes of a MAC address belong to a certain company? Well, vendor IDs are leased out to certain companies. And based on the vendor ID, you can tell who made a particular um, USB device, with some weird exceptions which I'll get to later on. I was hoping that this hub device would be something fairly unique that you could scan for and say, if you see anything with this vendor ID, you probably have an issue. But this is pretty generic. Like I said, this is just a Texas Instruments hub device. But it does show up as something. The key log, however, is completely passive. And so is the key llama, and so is the key ghost. The key carbon was the only one I was able to detect that way. Uh, USB plug and unplug events I was hoping was going to reveal something. However, I'm not sure how to get that actually to log in the event log. If you have a good idea, show me. It is logged in the registry someplace, but when you reboot the machine, everything is seen as being plugged and unplugged, or unplugged and plugged back in. So that timestamp gets reset frequently anyway, so that's of limited ability. Um, USB speed changes. And this shows some promise. I've noticed in the past when I plugged in a thumb drive in line with my key log, for instance, a lot of keyboards nowadays have USB hubs built into them. For instance, uh, this Dell USB keyboard has its own hub, and sometimes someone might plug a thumb drive into that hub. If you notice that something in line is at a slower speed than it should be, that might lead someone to start looking around and maybe there's a, a rogue USB device on that particular machine. However, I tested with a oh, hold on, just I, I tested with a newer version of the keylog, essentially the keylog, the rebranded keylog, and I didn't have a problem at all. So they've gotten better on that. Yes, sir. I haven't noticed the difference. That's not to say there isn't a difference. Not enough testing's been done. Yes, Ziploc. Uh, yes. And you start noticing really weird USB effects, like some stuff's not working the way it should. That is something to, to, to start looking into. Now, while I said most of these are pretty stealthy and don't show up anything while they're logging, if someone uh, tries to recover the logs on the same machine they're logging, a lot of these can be detected. That's why I said if you're a pen tester and you don't want to be detected, you want to take this home or back to the office before you pull the logs off of it. Uh, I was looking around on um, one of my machines that I had a hardware key log in before, and I noticed there was a device called a Ulysses keyboard. I'm like, what the hell is a Ulysses keyboard? Maybe that was one of the devices that was created at some point in time when I had the hardware keylogger in and I had it in recovery mode. Ends up it was. I did a little bit more research on it, and this particular um, the keyboard was created every time I put my key carbon keylogger in recovery mode. And I looked up the vendor ID. The vendor ID belongs to Apple. Key carbon isn't made by Apple. Now, I don't know if there's any legal issues with one electronics company taking someone else's vendor ID and using it. I don't know if that's a legal issue or if that's just a weird policy issue with the USB IF. But an Apple keyboard plugged into a a Windows PC is kind of an odd event. Yes, sir. Yeah. Maybe they were just building the keylogger from recycled parts. 
You know, that's possible. I honestly do not know. It, the people who uh, have make the key carbon bought the company and used to make the key phantom. So if I search the history of it, I might be able to find that information out. Then there's some other uh, – oh, let me back up two slides. If you ever want to look up vendor IDs, there's two good sources I've seen. The Linux USB project has a large list of uh, IDs in hexadecimal. This particular uh, organization, the USBIF, has their own. I emailed them to get a complete list. They said they don't keep a complete list. This is the completest list I can find on – I believe that's their website. Uh, this is, however, in decimal notation, so make sure you convert it. And these slides will be on my uh, uh, web page shortly after I get home, if anybody needs the links. Or you can just ask me later on in the con, and I'll get it off my thumb drive. Uh, but it wouldn't be a driver's issue. It would be something that would be in the hardware. The, 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 the vendor idea is in the hardware. Now, there might be some kind of open source Darwin USB flash firmware, or USB firmware. I don't, I, don't, I, I don't know, but to my knowledge, that would be something to be on board. That'd be, it's kind of like the equivalent, all right, this is a bad analogy, but sounds like a MAC address, sort of. Except for, it's like the first, what is it, the first four bytes of a MAC address? Six bytes. First six bytes of the MAC address that you can use to identify the vendor. Um, I plugged in the key ghost, and I noticed a couple of odd things. One, it had a serial number, which I'm pretty sure I didn't get the first one ever made, so that doesn't tell me a whole lot. But I looked, got the vendor ID 8880 in hexadecimal. I looked that up. I couldn't find it. No one seems to have that particular vendor ID. Um, I did the key log and the key llama. Same thing, different vendor ID, but no one seemed to have... 19 AE. By the way, the application I'm using, the first application I used was USB View in uh, Linux. This application is Nearsoft's uh, USB D View, which is another great tool for tracking what USB devices are on your. Uh, the, the links I provided are the only ones I can really find. Vendor IDs to what manufacturer owns them? Yeah, the two links I provided earlier are the only ones I know of. I could, those are the best sources I've found. If you find a better one, please email me, irongeek at irongeek.com. But those are the best ones I've found. And they're pretty extensive, but they don't have everything. Uh, anyway, these bad vendor IDs, in theory, it shouldn't be too hard to program a piece of software to search for your registry for these devices. Match the vendor ID, and if it shows up, you know someone's recovered the log in that particular machine. But like I said, this is only of use if someone recovers the log on the same machine they were logging. And I have a buddy back home named Jeff who is uh, much better programmer than I am. I think he's going to be doing some looking into this. All right. Another thing I looked into in the uh, – who here has ever used a Windows Management Interface, WMI? Great for Windows Management. Less great now that uh, port 138 is always blocked pretty much by the Windows firewall. But there's a lot of uh, Windows control and automation you can do with it. There is something in there for doing voltage probe and current probe on devices. However, I don't know if it's based on what BIOS you have, what hardware you have. I was hoping there would be a way to detect extra current because these things have to be powered somehow to do what they do. So you should see some kind of voltage drop and some kind of increase in current. But I've yet to figure out a way of doing that. Uh, but it's something I want to look into a little bit further. If anybody is better at uh, programming low level on PC hardware, let me know. Also, and so this goes back to a question I made earlier, um, if – you want to track back who particularly installed one on you. Mo a lot of these hardware keyloggers have serial numbers on them. And you see these are the stickers that someone could peel off. But it's possible you might be able to talk back to the vendor. This is a keylog, a key llama, and another key llama, a PS2 model key llama. It's possible you could track back who bought it based on this. Though my understanding, they don't necessarily want to reveal that information to people. So, But if the FBI or the NSA asked, they might get that information. Also, I'd imagine it's a pretty good idea if you're doing a legal investigation and you find a keylogger to have a professional forensics person and get good chain of custody and have them remove it for you so they can fingerprint it and so forth. What, what would be a good recommendation if you happen to find a keylogger? Well, in most cases, you're not going to know that it was, so you have to like, look at it, pull it out, know that it was a keylogger in the first place. You probably already knew it. But. Yeah, well, if, if I saw this plugged into this, plugged into my, ma my machine, I would know what it is. And a lot of computer geeks would know what it is. So if you see it like that, 
should you just call the cops and get um, one of the forensic investigators out? If domestic dispute, I imagine this we can ignore. But I'm talking about if you find one in your company. Yeah, in your company. Okay. Yes. Have you seen like any like bright green key loggers that look like a uh, adapter for USB to PS2 or PSP? Actually, I have seen them in different colors, and I know a couple companies sell them in different colors for like Macintoshes, which is white. So do they look like a, a, key, a keyboard adapter from USB to PS2? Or PS2? Yes, I've seen ones that are purple. Well, not adapters necessarily, but I've seen ones that are purple so they match the normal spec of having a purple end on a keyboard. Might be possible. I haven't really looked into it. I, most of the ones I've seen are little itty-bitty ones like this. Not that I know of. Also, Keylama is in the U.S., but they order from Keylog and other companies, are, and Keylog is in Poland. So I really don't, I'm really not qualified to tell you what's going to happen on that. But Keylog itself is in Poland. Keylama is a U.S. company, as, my, as I understand. The other companies, I'm not sure where they're based out of. Oh, an issue I told you about the... Uh, Key Ghost and how um, when I got my first one, I busted it. Well, as you can see, here's the uh, Key Ghost. It's one of the forensics units with time stamping. It has a little battery on it. I took it apart because I wanted to see what chips are in it. And you can't see it here, but you can see it up on the screen. They sanded off the IC chip so I couldn't see what particular model chips were on it. But if anybody wants to play with that later, let me know. I'll have it upstairs. And you can see the internals. And with a little more work, I'm, you can probably figure out what chips what. All right, let's go into cost of these different things. And in the case of, in, in the, uh, for the sake of full disclosure, uh, I am an affiliate with uh, Key Llama. So if anybody goes to my website and tries to buy one, I do get a small bit of cash. But, you know, you don't have to go through my link to do it. And I really do think they offer a pretty good product. And they'll be offering one with encryption before all for long, my understanding. Uh, so there's a reason why I recommend them over most people, but here's a few of them. The Key Carbon USB Forensics, 2 megabytes of storage, is 300 bucks. Now, it has time stamping and 128-bit encryption. What encryption algorithm it's using, I do not know. I'm assuming AES, but I'm not sure. So that's pretty expensive. And there's also the Key Carbon USB Home. I believe the USB Home is the one I have. Still really expensive, but like I showed you earlier, also the easiest to detect. So I can't highly recommend it. However, they do supposedly pride themselves in having great keyboard compatibility. So that might be some for them. Uh, some of the PCI ones I talked about, they run about uh, 377 bucks for 128 megabytes. That wireless one I was ta talking to you all about that uh, logs over Bluetooth, or you can recover the logs via Bluetooth, uh, it cost, for 4 megs, it's uh, 225 bucks, which is kind of expensive. They have an embedded unit that's only 199 bucks. I'm trying to get one of those in for review. Don't know if I'll be able to. Now on to the ones I uh, like better, at least as far as value. The Key Llama USB, it's 2 megabytes. It was $118 last time I checked. There's no encryption offered, but it's been pretty reliable for me other than, um, other than some issues with that one particular Dell and Dell keyboard. Uh, the basic Key Llama without uh, any kind of modification, it's 4 megabytes. It's only 88 bucks. I'd get that one, personally. Uh, if you want to go a little bit cheaper... The current key llamas are essentially key loggers that have been rebranded, and I'm not an affiliate of key log, K-E-E -E log. Um, they're a little bit cheaper, but if there's any warranty issues, if there's a warranty on them at all, or if you have any hardware problems, you'd have to send them back to Poland for issues. So possibly the extra 8 bucks you spend, you get an extra 2 uh, megs of storage, and you only have to send it to the United States as opposed to Poland. If you want to go uh, crazy on storage... I want to say the uh, Key Llama, uh, yeah, Key Llama USB hardware key logger 2 gigabyte is like 200 bucks. That's a fair amount of storage, a lot of logs. Uh, apparently the 2, uh, two, two uh, kilobyte uh, PS2 one is only $148.88. 
For the value, I'm personally a fan of the Key Log and the Key Llama. And probably all in all for value, I'd probably order from Poland, get the Key Logger. And once I said, I don't make no money off of them, but I still highly recommend them because they've been very good for me and very stealthy. Uh, for one gigabyte, of sto- one gigabyte of storage, it's 100 bucks. The two meg- megabytes cheaper, but not by a whole lot. And the ones I've tested from them have worked really well, so I like them. All right, one little final topic, because I'm, no, I'm sh- really short on time, actually almost past. Um, I've come up with some ideas about how you could socially engineer uh, getting these things installed. I am not a social ne- engineer. I'm just a geek with time on his hands. I use my personality as birth control, so I'm not the person that should be giving anybody advice on social engineering. But I had a few ideas on how you could get someone to install this for you. Send them a, fr- a free piece of software and say, I have this piece of software. Normally it says it expires, but I have this little special USB anti-piracy dongle you have to install. It doesn't even take up any ports. You can just plug it in line with your keyboard. Works fine that way. And this will keep your software from expiring. Then when it expires later on, say, oh, I must have sent you the wrong dongle. E- uh, ma- snail mail me back the dongle, and I'll send you a new one. At that point, you have the log back. I don't know if you'll get anybody to fall for that, but I'm thinking there's some people who can get to fall for that. Or you can send someone that video about uh, electronic, uh, emissions, I- electronic emissions and uh, getting the logs that way and say, if you use one of these, these add a special kind of impedance to the line that keeps that from happening. So you're going to increase your security by installing this. You could do that. You know, let your mind wander. Someone that's a better social engineer can figure that out. If it's one of the PCI internal ones, tell them it's some kind of hardware accelerator. Tell them it's a you know, a video card that adds extra power to the current machine. Yeah, you know, there's all sorts of ideas of what you can do. Or the human factor, just uh, bribe a help desk worker. That's always going to be a tried and true method. All right, links. I have on my website, and this is going to be me pimping my website for a bit, I have uh, three different articles I've written on hardware key logging, and I go into a lot more details on these individual key loggers. I have two videos on how these hardware key loggers work. Those at the bottom. If you're interested in what vendors I've been playing around with, like I said, uh, key, uh, I don't make any money off of any of these but uh, Key Llama, and you don't have to necessarily go through mine. So I just want to full disclosure so people don't think I'm trying to make money on it. I don't sell these things. I just review them. Uh, these are the companies I've been playing around with. I haven't got one from Wireless Key Logger yet, but I'm interested in getting one for playing around with. Those are the people that make that uh, one you can recover the logs via Bluetooth with. Uh, Shout-outs to the Informaticon Computer Club and the ISSA Kentuckiana. And uh, Brian and everybody else has helped me uh, prep up for this uh, presentation. And if there's any questions, I'm already past my time, so I'm going to go straight upstairs after collecting some stuff in my room, and people can ask me more questions up there. Because I think the next speaker's up. Thank you. <laughs>